Skoda has established itself in the mid-sized SUV segment with this Kodiak, a model now usefully upgraded with a smarter look both inside and out, and some more efficient engines. You can still have seven seats and four-wheel drive, and whatever spec is chosen, you still get class-leading passenger space and a range of distinctly Skoda, simply clever features. It can tow up to two and a half tons too, and has one of the largest boots in its class. In other words, you'd have to take this contender seriously. Let's put this car to the test. The Skoda Kodiak. It seems astonishing to think that prior to the original launch of this car in 2016, the Czech brand had never brought the European market a family-sized SUV. The Kodiak was that car and it proved to be a game changer for the brand. In 2021, it was fully updated, creating the model we're gonna look at here. Today, it's one of five SUVs the brand offers, but it remains hugely significant for Skoda with over 600,000 sales registered prior to the launch of this facelifted model and production plants in China, India and Russia, as well as Skoda's domestic factory in Kvizny. That allows this car to sell in around 60 markets across the globe. Most Kodiaks are sold in seven seat form in which guys this car faces up directly to almost identically engineered models from two other VW Group brands, the Seat Taraco and the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace. Potential customers might also be looking at cars like the Peugeot 5008 and the Nissan X-Trail. Plenty of competition then, hence the need for this midterm update, which brought us a slightly sharper look, a smarter customer interior, improved safety and connectivity, and more efficient engines. Everything, in other words, you'd expect from a facelift. But will it all be enough to keep this Kodiak competitive in its tightly fought market? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. Skoda has refreshed the engine portfolio for this updated Kodiak model, but there are no significant dynamic changes, so it'll all be quite recognizable if you're familiar with earlier versions of this car. If you're approaching a drive hoping for a rewarding time at the wheel, then you're obviously a very optimistic sort of a person. Uh, even in the modern era, big, spacious, seven-seat SUVs have a reputation for handling with all the dynamic finesse of a channel ferry, as do big Skodas. It's pleasantly surprising then to find that the Kodiak is actually quite an agile thing by class standards. It's relatively lightweight and its rigid chassis delivers decent body control through the turns. Uh, even more noticeable is the way that the four-link rear suspension uh, provides a firmish quality of ride that's a world away from the soft, floaty springing you get in the Czech brand's similarly priced superb estate. But then the underpinnings of this car are also a world away from anything Skoda has previously brought us in a big family car and a good deal more advanced than anything direct seven seat rivals can offer. Uh, the Kodiak rides on the same stiff, sophisticated MQB platform used in its two identically engineered VW Group arch rivals, the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace and the Seat Taraco. And, like those two models, against direct segment alternatives like Nissan's X-Trail or pricier options like Kia Sorento and Hyundai's Santa Fe, the Kodiak emerges as a far more accomplished thing to drive. In fact, only Land Rover's much more expensive Discovery Sport can rival the way that this Czech SUV can push on through the twisty stuff if you're running late on the way back from the school run. It's a pity then that the rather light and over-assisted steering does its best to spoil things. The setup communicates relatively little about what's happening beneath the wheels. Pricier models do get standard progressive steering, which uses variable steering rack and pinion gearing to give more direct responses to larger steering angles, but it doesn't help much with the overall feedback. In theory, it is possible to do something about this as response at the helm is one of the things that you can change via the drive mode select system that most models feature beyond entry level trim. 
Uh, this is one of those setups that allows you to alter throttle response, steering feel, and on the DSG automatic models, gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. Uh, there are three main options, eco, normal, and sport, uh, plus an individual setting too, if you want to key in your own parameters. 4x4 models get a snow mode 2, and that's geared towards providing some extra winter start-off traction. All of this is good to have, but none of the available choices really sort out the steering issue. In fact, to be honest, uh, flipping through the various settings doesn't make a massively noticeable difference to the Kodiak driving experience unless you've paid extra to complete the setup's functionality by adding in Skoda's DCC Dynamic Chassis Control Adaptive Damping Package. Do that and you'll get an extra drive mode select comfort mode which really does significantly improve the ride of this car on unsettled surfaces. If you're coming to this model from say a softly sprung Skoda Superb Estate, we think you'll really like this option. We should talk about engines, which predictably are almost exactly the same as those used in the Tiguan Allspace and the Taraco VW Group sister models that we just mentioned. Skoda has structured the range so that almost all buyers will end up going for a 150 PS unit, either a 1.5 litre TSI petrol power plant or more likely a 2 litre TDI diesel, the latter black pump fuel unit being from the VW Group's latest Evo generation featuring the conglomerate's cleaner twin in dosing technology which lowers NOx emissions by up to 80%. In both cases the performance figures are comparable, rest to 62 in around 9.5 seconds on the way to 125 miles an hour flat out but of course the diesel has more pulling power, 360 newton meters as opposed to 250. You'd think this would make a difference if you're planning on doing a bit of towing with this car and sure enough it's to the DSG 4x4 version of the 2 litre TDI 150 PS model. You'll need to turn if you want the highest brake towing capacity in the range, uh, some 2,300 kilos. If you're looking at those two mainstream engines, bear in mind that the 1.5 litre unit can be had with manual transmission, but unlike the 2 litre TDI 150 PS diesel, it can't be ordered with the option of four wheel drive. If neither of the two mainstream engines suit, then your dealer will wheel out some other more powerful options, uh, which, as you might expect, only come in combination with automatic transmission and four-wheel drive. There's a top 200 PS version of the diesel unit that replaces the old TDI 190 PS variant. Uh, alternatively, there's a 190 PS version of the brand's new improved uh, two-liter TSI petrol power plant, which now features a higher, more efficient 350 bar injection pressure. Either way, you get almost identical performance figures, rest to 60 doing just under eight seconds, and a top speed of around 132 miles an hour. Beyond that lies the top sporting VRS variant that we're trying here, uh, which has, as part of this facelift, swapped the bi-turbo 240 PS diesel it used to have for a 245 PS version of the 2-litre TSI petrol power plant. Can't kind help of being rather disappointed by this. The old bi-turbo diesel VRS with its uh, charismatic bi-turbo diesel snarl was one of our favorite family all-rounders. The TSI engine is on paper a bit faster. The rest of 62 sprint takes just 6.6 .6 seconds, half a second faster than the old diesel, but it lacks the black pump uh, unit's addictive mid-range pulling power. At least VRS customers still get standard DCC adaptive damping, and you can replicate the old diesel variant snarl by adding the uh, sport engine sound option in the drive mode select system. Buyers in this class don't want fully fledged off-road capability, so Skoda hasn't delivered it on any variant in the range. The Kodiak's car-like monocoque chassis doesn't offer much in the way of axle articulation, plus there's obviously no low-range gearbox and no way of manually locking the differential for the really sticky stuff. Uh, on top of that, the ground clearance on mainstream models is a decidedly modest 187 millimeters, which won't help you when you're wading through flash floods on the rural school run. The optional 4x4 system on offer is the usual Volkswagen Group on-demand setup that cuts in when lack of traction demands it, but it can't be locked into all-wheel drive. Go for that and you'll get a package of extra electronic driving aids, including the additional drive mode select system snow mode we mentioned earlier. 
More significantly, you also get this off-road button by the gear stick, which focuses all the car's electronic systems for off-piste use and introduces hill descent control to ease you down slippery slopes. It also brings up an off-road information screen into the center dash monitor with three dials whose information you can tailor to what you want to see. Choose between altitude, compass, wheel, angle, oil temperature or engine temperature. If you specify the DCC adaptive damping system, when the off-road option is selected, the shock absorbers will also appropriately change their mode of operation. In the very unlikely event that you're going to be copying the adventurous families who are featured in Skoda's advertising and taking to the rough stuff on regular weekend expeditions, uh, you should really bear in mind that the approach angle, 15.7 degrees, and the departure angle, 19.1 degrees, are both decidedly un-SUV-like. But few customers seem to care, which is why the UK market's no longer offered the more rugged-looking Scout version of this model. Uh, you can, though, get an optional rough road package uh, that will give you an engine underguard and an understone guard. But if you're planning to regularly do the kind of driving in this Skoda that would require that, then we would suggest that you've probably chosen the wrong car. For virtually all Kodiak customers, the four-wheel drive system will be chosen for winter conditions that they might meet on road rather than off it. Uh, sure enough, on a slippery morning, you'll notice the extra stability that it gives the car through the corners as the uh, Clever software uses a multi-plate clutch to vary the amount of torque that's being sent to the rear axle. In fact, whatever drive layout you choose for your Kodiak, you should find it to be an agreeable, family-orientated commuting tool. On the highway, refinement is impressive, and this Skoda is also happily free of the kind of sway and lean that crosswinds can cause at high speeds in some tall-sided cars. In town, that light steering comes into its own, combining with the glassy bodywork to make manoeuvring easier than you think it would be in a vehicle of this size. Uh, in other words, it's a thoroughly well-engineered product. Skoda's sharp, clean-cut design language has translated very well into the kind of purposeful, premium look required of a modern full-sized SUV. This Kodiak's just 8mm longer than the Czech brand's Octavia family hatch, but it looks far larger, with striking styling supposed to convey an impression of protection and strength. For this revised version, uh, design chief Oliver Stefani sought to add a crisper front-end look and more dynamic tail treatment, but the changes are pretty subtle. Most of them feature here at the front, where there's more elevated bonnet and a redesigned, more upright Skoda grille. Uh, the headlights flanking it, which is still inspired by traditional Czech crystal glass art, are now slimmer and they get full LED beams with the option, as here, of intelligent matrix technology. Plus, there are rearranged fog lamps. Uh, mainstream models, they gain aluminium effect trim on the front apron, but here we've got the top VRS variant, which gets black detailing, a specific front bumper and a gloss black finish for the grille. Uh, the original styling was overseen by Bugatti Veyron designer Josef Caban, and he didn't bother to embellish it with the kind of SUV frippery that you'll find on some rivals. So there are no skid plates or aggressive corner air intakes built into this lower grille section. Instead, the emphasis here is on the kind of precise, high-tech quality. Well, that still works too. Not much has changed in profile apart from the now more aerodynamic wheel designs. Our rims range in size from 18 inches to the 20 inch Sagittarius alloys we have here. Uh, the rugged look plastic clad wheel arches really need larger rim sizes to complete the intended SUV look, which is emphasized here by roof rails and strong lower seals. It's all very practical rather than trying to be sporty, which is why the Chinese market gets an additional separate Kodiak GT SUV coupe model. 
Uh, the profile silhouette uh, for this standard design is very much defined by this powerful upper crease which runs from the headlights to the tail lamp clusters and there's a lower swage line further down to give the flanks some shape. Uh, the overall proportions reflect the pricing uh, with the dimensions pitching uh, the size of this car somewhere between a Nissan X-Trail and the Kia Sorento. Here at the rear, the roof spoiler has been redesigned, complete with its third brake light. Plus, the rear window below is narrower and there are slimmer, more sharply designed LED tail lights with crystalline structures which form the Skoda typical C-shaped light cluster. This VRS model sets itself apart with distinct badging and a reflector which uh, spans the entire width of the car. As usual, of course, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, the MQB platform that this car shares with its slightly smaller Karok SUV showroom stablemate. In short, what we've got here is a slick, sensible piece of design embellished by the odd practical flourish. Take our favourite Rolls-Royce style touch, that's the umbrella built into the front door here. You can store it in the opposite front door too. Now back in 2016, the Kodiak's cabin was the classiest thing we'd ever seen on a Skoda. But time moves on and five years later, it was starting to look a little plain and low tech. So the mid-term upgrades here are very welcome. Here we have the top VRS model with its micro suede trimmed sports seats and red stitching. But even humbler models have taken a big step forward in cabin ambiance, primarily due to additions like classier decorative strips, additional contrasting stitching and enhanced LED ambient lighting. Plusher models can now be ordered with perforated, ergonomically supportive leather seats and the enhanced 10-speaker Canton sound system that we have here. Plus, the steering wheel has now been redesigned. It's of the capacitive sort now, and that can register hand movement on the rim. It's fashioned in a style that apparently harks back to some of Skoda's more historic models, and it features smart, chromed, uh, knurled scroll wheels. Overall, the Kodiak design team has managed the difficult feat of delivering a much nicer interior, yet one that still leaves scope for pricier VW Group sister SUVs like Audi's Q5 to feel more opulent. You certainly don't feel like you're in a car that's around £3,500 cheaper than a comparable Kia Sorento. Particularly if you have a variant like this one fitted with the brand's latest improved cabin screen tech. It's not as in your face and sophisticated as it is in the brand's comparable cheaper Octavia hatch. And that betrays the fact that this is essentially a much older design. Indeed, entry level trim in a Kodiak still gets you old fashioned analog dials and an eight inch Amundsen center dash no bigger than the screen size of the original model. Although it does now incorporate an eSIM for always on connectivity. Plus, it includes navigation, in-car Wi-Fi, and now wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Uh, above base spec level, you can now make your Kodiak's cabin considerably more up-to-date with the kind of layout that we have here. And that gets you a 10.25-inch virtual cockpit digital display for the instrument binnacle and a larger 9.2-inch Columbus infotainment monitor for the center of the dash. We'll start with the binnacle screen, which is a bit smaller than the virtual cockpit display that you'll get in Audis, but it works in much the same way with layout arrows on buttons to the right of the steering wheel, uh, which offer a standard choice of four main graphic layouts. Uh, primarily, you'll probably use this standard one with two configurable virtual dials separated by a central display with selectable information. An alternative segmented layout works the same way, just with without the dials. Uh, this silver roller switch on the right uh, allows you to select what appears in the uh, center of the infotainment screen, uh, range, convenience consumers, uh, speed, oil temperature, or trip consumption. You can then tailor what appears in the center of the two outer dials, or with the alternative layout, the two outer segments, using the vehicle section of the infotainment monitor in the center of the dash. Uh, this gives a classic option where the virtual dials will show chosen gear ratio on the left and speed on the right. 
or you can select from a whole range of things to display in either dial. Uh, consumption, distance covered, driving time, route guidance, range, destination info, uh, compass, terrain height, audio settings or acceleration. Now, if you don't like either of the two standard layouts, then two further are available via the view buttons. One that allows you to prioritize a particular informational feature to show right across the instrument binnacle screen, and the other, a more minimalistic layout that just shows range and speed. Sportline and VRS models also get a fifth sport layout that prioritizes a single speedometer dial with selectable info either side. Lots of information then, but there may be yet more you need to know at the wheel of your Kodiak. Uh, anything that the instrument binnacle display can't tell you, and much that it can, will be covered off by this centre dash touchscreen we mentioned earlier, which is particularly sophisticated in the top 9.2 inch Columbus form we have here. Now thankfully, unlike the larger display you'll get on an Octavia, it doesn't have to control the ventilation functions through sub-menus, although it does have a very detailed air conditioning and air care screen section. Uh, this glass fronted monitor is predictably great in terms of clarity and ease of use, although it would benefit from the addition uh, of some physical shortcut buttons, a traditional volume knob and a few more uh, back buttons as you scroll through the various menus. Uh, the main home screen allows you to choose from key options like radio, media, navigation, drive assist, telephone and vehicle sections, plus that smart link setup uh, via which you can activate the aforementioned wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Uh, this monitor reacts to close finger gestures before you actually touch it and its built-in eSIM enables you to create a Wi-Fi hotspot. As you want, you can hold and drag display icons to move them around or you can create a split screen which will enable you to, uh, for example, display a sat-nav map, Bluetooth, car info and phone settings all at the same time. Uh, there's also an online shop which will allow you to upgrade certain elements of the car's technology after you've bought it. And that's uh, using an over-the-air update system, which will allow Skoda to potentially improve the screen's functionality over time. This larger Columbus monitor also includes LoRa, Skoda's digital assistant voice control system. This reacts to voice commands like go to Milton Keynes, activating navigation, or I'm cold, which activates the air conditioning. Uh, clever digital microphones are able to ensure clear voice recognition and also locate the person who's speaking, either the driver or the front passenger. So if the front passenger asks for the heated seat to be switched on, for example, the system will recognize the identity of the questioner and only activate the front passenger's heated seat. Uh, it's really neat. This LoRa system uses the same software and functionality as the Hello Volkswagen setup in the Mark 8 Golf, but for some reason we simply haven't found it to be as intuitive or responsive, and sometimes we just got tired of waiting for it to work or of needing to use exactly the right words to ensure precise functionality. Getting comfortably straightforward with lots of seat and wheel adjustment, uh, making it easy to find the ideal position. We like the little touches too, like this uh, lovely ratcheting centre armrest, or just below the so-called jumbo box, a versatile storage area between the seats, including a removable element featuring a tray on one side and coin and cup holders on the other. Uh, there are plenty of other storage areas around the front of the cabin too. Uh, disappointment at the way that the size of the main glove box is compromised by all the media equipment it's expected to accommodate. That's quickly tempered when you realise that a second glove box is concealed behind this trim panel just above. Uh, there is also a small storage box by the driver's right knee, a windscreen clip for parking tickets, a side net in the passenger footwell and decently sized fabric lined door bins that are big enough to hold a one litre bottle. There's also this neat covered tray in front of the gear stick, which incorporates a couple of USB ports with a 12 volt socket and can optionally contain this wireless phone charging pad. 
It is irritating that the ice fix attachment for the front seat costs extra. Uh, some models get drawers under the front seats and usually there's an overhead sunglasses compartment, uh, although here that's been sacrificed for the button panel needed for this optional panoramic sunroof. Enough of what it's like at the front of this Kodiak. Let's check out the rear now, and that's accessed by these wide opening doors. The second row bench features all the versatility you'd want from this kind of seven-seat SUV. So the backrest reclines for greater comfort on long journeys, and the base slides back and forth through uh, 180 millimeters. Even with it fully back, there's nothing like the legroom that you'd find in a comparably priced Skoda Superb Estate. But with up to 104 millimeters of stretch out room available, a couple of lanky occupants will still probably be more than satisfied. Although you don't get as much elbow room as you would in slightly wider class contenders like Kia Sorento and Hyundai's Santa Fe. Which means that those rivals will be a touch more accommodating should it be necessary to take three adults back here. In a Kodiak, things aren't helped in this regard by this raised central transmission tunnel, although it's not as prominent as some we've seen in this class. Overall, a trio of grown-up folk could just about be accommodated without too many spatial compromises, helped by the way that the boxy bodywork delivers plenty of headroom. The panoramic sunroof we mentioned certainly helps give the cabin an area feel if it's been fitted, and it doesn't compromise headroom too much. As for practicalities, well, there are centre air vents above a small storage tray and ice fix child seat fastenings for the outer two seats, while the fold-out centre armrest distinguishes itself by offering no fewer than three cup holders. So, what's it like in the third row? That's assuming, of course, that you want space for up to six or seven folk. Uh, Five-seat only Kodiak models are available further down the range if you don't. Gaining access to the very rear of the car requires you to pull up these latches on the second row seat shoulders. This ought to be a one-handed pull and push forward operation, but unfortunately, uh, these latches are so stiff that two hands are actually needed to get the job done. Uh, once the seat has moved, there's just enough of a gap for kids or moderately athletic adults to jump into the very back. <clears throat> Well, back here, you're quickly reminded that this is an SUV, not an MPV. If you're an adult, unless you've got extremely accommodating middle row passengers who slid their seats right forward, you'll find your legroom pretty restricted. Uh, nor has Skoda compensated by copying rivals who have designed third row seating, which is slightly raised so that occupants can have a better view of the road ahead. Uh, the brand will point out that these pews are only really designed for kids, uh, and we would agree with that before asking why, if that's the case, the designers still haven't fitted these chairs out with the ice fix child seat fastenings that parents will need. To be fair to Skoda, most rival brand models make the same mistake. Overall, though, the space back here isn't really any more restricted than it would be in any other mid-sized SUV of this kind, and uncomplaining adults uh, joining you for short journeys will probably be quite glad of it. Uh, small storage areas are provided either side. Uh, the left-hand one features a cup holder, and the right-hand one here includes a 12-volt socket. And from back here, we like the way that the audio system amplifies your voice so that the driver doesn't have to bellow at kids in the very back. <sighs> so let's finish by heading back to the tailgate, pausing on the way to notice another of uh, Skoda's trumpeted so-called Simply Clever Touches, uh, this ice scraper that's built into the fuel filler cap. At the back, the hatch can be specified to raise electrically, and as a further option, you can pay extra for a virtual pedal feature, and that will allow you to raise it with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper, uh, something that will come in very useful if, key in pocket, you're approaching the car uh, laden down with bags. 
With the tailgate raised, the huge apertures revealed, complete with a usefully low loading sill. Even better news if you've gone for a seven seat variant like this one and you have all three rows upright is that there's still space behind the rearmost seat backs for more than a couple of plastic shopping bags. 270 litres of capacity to be exact and that's about the same as you get in the boot of a super mini. To give some uh, class perspective here, with seven seats in place, a rival Land Rover Discovery Sport that offers offers just 115 litres of cargo space. Most of the time, owners of seven-seat Kodiak models are probably going to be using their cars with these rearmost seats folded into the floor. Uh, that's an action that's easy and simple to complete. In which case, there's 560 litres of space on offer with the middle row positioned as far back as it'll go, like this. You'll increase that to uh, 765 litres if you push the bench forward. For reference, five-seat models offer a 720-litre boot. Whatever variant you go for, you'll find that Skoda provides an adjustable height boot floor, but its functionality is severely compromised if, as we would advise, you specify the space saver spare wheel that we have here. We do, though, like the way that even with that in place, you can position the boot floor board vertically to stop loose items from sliding forward when only two seating rows are in use. A stretchy net can be clipped into place uh, to also help in that regard. Other useful cargo area features include the way that you can store the tonneau cover beneath the boot floor. Yes, even with a spare wheel fitted, thankfully standard. Uh, there are also fold-out hooks on either side wall and a fixed one either side too, plus a 12 volt socket on the right. If you need to accommodate longer items, the 40-20-40 split folding functionality of the second row seatbacks will be welcome. Uh, that allows you to push through longer items like skis uh, without disturbing a couple of uh, rear seated passengers. Not so good is the fact that an important practical feature which you would expect to find in a model of this class is missing here. The cargo sidewall catches which would enable you to flatten that middle seating row without leaving the rear of the car. Skoda has rather meanly decided to make those optional and we haven't even got them here on this top model. Which means that you have to go around to the side of the car and you have to pull on these straps if you want to push down the second row seat backs. Do that and the class leadingly large 2005 litre space is revealed or 2065 litres in a five seat only model. In true Skoda style, value remains a strong Kodiak calling card, even though prices have risen substantially. Uh, when we first tested this car back in 2016, prices started at around £25,000. Now the overwhelming majority of buyers will spend between £33,000 and £36,000 on a variant with 150 PS, either a 1.5 litre TSI petrol engine or a 2 litre TDI diesel. Petrol power is obviously cheaper, but most will want to find the extra £2,900 to get that diesel unit. The 1.5 litre TSI variant is the only model in the range that can be had with manual transmission. It will save you £1,500 over the auto, but either way you can only have front wheel drive. The now auto only 2 litre TDI can be had with four wheel drive for an extra £2,000. There are five trim levels, SE Drive, SEL Executive, Sportline, Laurent and Clément and this top VRS variant. Only base SE Drive offers the option of doing without a third seating row at a saving of just over £1,000. Otherwise, your Kodiak has to be a seven-seater. Uh, the more powerful engines further up the range, they're only offered with four-wheel drive and they require a serious spend. Think around £43,000 upwards for either the 2.0-litre TDI 200 PS diesel or the 2.0-litre TSI 190 PS petrol. And you'll need to find nearly £48,000 for this now petrol-powered top VRS 2.0-litre TSI 245 PS sporting variant. Uh, from a Skoda perspective, the prices being asked here are around £2,000 above what you'd pay for a comparably engined superb estate and around £5,000 more than you'd have to find for a comparably engined Octavia estate. If you don't actually need an SUV or seven seats, then that spacious superb station wagon is well worth checking out as an alternative. 
But what you'll really want to know is how this model compares on price to its direct segment rivals. Now, the obvious place to start is with this Kodiak model's identically engineered VW Group rivals, the uh, Seat Taraco and the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace. Well, the Taraco might save you a few hundred, while an equivalent Tiguan Allspace, that could cost you a couple of thousand more. There are other options, of course, but they're not quite as directly comparable. We'll start with the Peugeot 5008. That sits in the same price bracket, but it only comes with front-wheel drive, and it has mainstream engines, which are significantly less powerful than those of this Skoda. Uh, the Land Rover Discovery Sport, that also sits in the same price bracket, but it costs a lot more to run because it's quite a lot heavier. And also, it has significantly less interior and luggage space. You could save a bit with a Nissan X-Trail, but again, uh, with one of those, you'd get less interior and luggage space. The Korean contenders in this class have been moved up market and they all come with four-wheel drive and more powerful engines as standard. Even Sangyong's Rexton, which will feel a bit crude compared to a Kodiak, but which does have standard four-wheel drive and is much better off-road, that costs from around £36,000, although you do get a 202 PS diesel engine for that. For a Kia Sorento, uh, prices start at around £41,000 for the petrol models or around £43,000 for a diesel. Hyundai Santa Fe, that can't now be had as a diesel. Uh, prices start from around £40,000. If, having considered all this, you conclude it is a Kodiak that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Skoda has been when it comes to that standard specification. So, let's see. Uh, even entry-level SE drive spec gets you 18-inch alloy wheels, uh, roof rails, front fog lights, LED headlights and tail lamps, an alarm and powered heated mirrors. Uh, those headlights have dusk auto sensors and washers, plus there are rain-sensitive wipers, rear parking sensors, and sunset glass to reduce the glare. Inside at SE drive level, there's air conditioning, a rear view camera, a trip computer, and neat touches, including ice scraper built into the fuel filler lid and door edge protectors that spring out to stop you damaging the edges of the door when you're getting out in a tight car park. Plus, there's dual zone climate control, an auto dimming rear view mirror, uh, there's cruise control, and a typical Skoda touch, neat pull out umbrellas which slide into panels built into the front doors. Uh, infotainment, that's taken care of by an 8-inch Amundsen branded infotainment display uh, via which you access navigation and integrated Wi-Fi plus a DAB audio system and Bluetooth phone connectivity along with a smart link feature too which allows you to wirelessly connect in your phone using Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Uh, the infotainment system also includes a clever in-car communication system and that amplifies your voice through the rear speakers uh, so the back seat passengers will more easily be able to hear what the front seat folk are saying. Standard across the range is that uniquely Skoda Touch, the umbrella in the front door. Also standard is use of the Czech brand's clever, freely downloadable Skoda Connect app uh, with remote access, a year's use of which is free with the car. Uh, this will allow you to remotely lock or unlock your Kodiak from wherever you are. Uh, if you've forgotten where you've parked it, it'll give you area notification. And if having got that, you still can't find your car in a crowded car park, then the Connect app will allow you to remotely activate either the alarm, the head lights or the horn. It'll also give you a vehicle health report. It'll help you to schedule servicing and it'll give you various elements of extra driving data too. What if you want to progress further up the range? Well, if so, your first step up the trim ladder is SEL Executive, which adds larger 19-inch wheels and chrome trimming for the roof rails, the front grille, and the window surrounds. Plus, intelligent matrix headlights with an adaptive front light system, a cornering function, and an all-weather lighting setup too. At this level, uh, there's also a powered tailgate and the drive modes select driving mode system by which you can alter gear changes, uh, throttle response and steering feel, all based on the way that you want to drive. 
SEL Executive trim also gets you leather upholstery, heated front seats, a powered driver's chair, uh, a wireless phone charger and grey interior stitching. Nearing the top of the range, you're offered a choice of a sporty look with the Sportline variants or a luxury orientation with the plush Laurent and Clément versions. Both get the brand's upgraded LED ambient lighting setup. Uh, Sportline spec gets you much of the look and feel of this top VRS. So black outer body styling cues, the three-spoke sport steering wheel and the micro suede trimmed sport seats all feature. Plus there are big 20-inch Vega alloy wheels. Lauren and Clement has 19 inch Sirius alloy wheels and it focuses on comfort with ventilated branded front seats, a panoramic sunroof, uh, the 10.25 inch virtual cockpit digital instruments and the company's improved 10 speaker Canton sound system. That only leaves this top VRS model, identifiable by its 20-inch Sagittarius alloy wheels, special badging, red-stitched interior and bespoke VRS front and rear bumpers. Here too, the digital instruments and the Canton sound system come as standard. On to options, there are a few key ones which we'll cover first. On SE Drive models, you might want to upgrade to the larger 9.2 inch Columbus centered dash infotainment screen. And on SE Drive and Sportline models, you might want to pay extra for the virtual cockpit digital instruments. Uh, if you have a bit more budget to spare, then the panoramic sunroof, which has been added here, is a really nice addition, as is the optional winter pack. And that'll give you heat for the uh, steering wheel and for the windscreen washer nozzles, a heated windscreen, and and also heat for the front seats if your chosen Kodiak doesn't already have those. That pack can be specified as here to add heat for the rear seats too. You'll also have to pay extra for some features you'd have hoped Skoda might have included as standard, like rear cargo sidewall catches to drop the second row backrest, a nice fixed attachment for the front passenger seat and a USB port by the rear view mirror. More active folk will want to add a tow bar, which on the Lauren and Clement models can be embellished with an auto steering trailer assist system. And if you're heading into the wilds, you'll want to add the rough road package with its engine guard and understone guard too. For the urban jungle, there's a park assist system, which will steer the car into spaces for you, plus a virtual pedal option, and that will allow you to open the powered tailgate with a kick option beneath the bumper. Uh, for the open road, you can add in adaptive cruise control. If you have kids, then we would recommend you look at the optional family pack. That includes rear side window blinds, uh, door edge protectors, and a bin in the door panel. The latter also is available separately, as are the rear window blinds, which also feature in the sleep pack. Now that uh, additionally gives you uh, acoustic glass, tinted rear windows, special rear seat headrests and textile floor mats with lounge steps. What else? Well, leather upholstery that many Sportline and VRS customers will want costs extra, as does powered front seat adjustment on all models bar the Laurent and Clément versions. With SEL Executive and Laurent and Clément models, the front seats can be ventilated with a massage function too. Uh, the two base trim levels allow you to order the upgraded LED interior light pack with Skoda puddle light projection that the rest of the range now has. Uh, with these two base models, you can add front seat back tables too. For the cabin, you can order textile floor mats and tablet holders for the rear of the front seats, or in the same position, smart holders that can take hooks, adapters, or hangers. You might also want to add a dash cam or a thermoelectric cooling box, which can keep food or drinks hot or cold, and which mounts in the middle of the rear seat. Pet owners may want the rear seat protection cover and the dog safety belt. For the boot, uh, there's a partition net and a netting system. An optional protection pack will give you a reversible boot floor liner, uh, mud flaps and textile fabric floor mats. The latter two items are also available separately. Bear in mind before you spend too much on any of that that you'll probably be spending extra on your choice of paint colour. The only standard ones are solid energy blue and meteor grey. Uh, otherwise it'll be extra for one of the metallic or pearl effect shades. We have metallic velvet red here. 
on base models there are various optional 18 inch wheel designs and talking of wheels you will of course want the space saver spare that we have fitted here even though it does get in the way of the adjustable height boot floor uh, side running boards are available as of course are the roof cross rails which will allow you to fit a roof box or racks for snowboards skis or kayaks on to safety. No really sophisticated new model these days comes without some sort of autonomous braking system. And sure enough, every Kodiak variant features the Volkswagen Group's effective front assist setup. Now this uh, scans the road ahead as you drive for potential collision hazards and it incorporates a city emergency brake feature and that deals with the specific requirements of urban motoring of up to 21 miles an hour. If the radar detects something you might be likely to hit then you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to the brakes will automatically be activated to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. The system also includes a pedestrian monitor which specifically searches for pedestrians who might be about to step out in front of you. Other sophisticated standard safety features include an award-winning automatic multi-collision braking system which automatically brakes the car down to six miles an hour after a collision. So if, say, uh, someone hits you and understandably you go to pieces, the car will automatically sort itself out. Avoid base trim and lane assist comes fitted which alerts you if you drift over the lane delineating lines and all versions of the Skoda also get an included Care Connect e-call emergency assistance feature. It's part of the Skoda Connect app that kicks in when the airbags deploy. It alerts the emergency services uh, with your exact GPS location plus it can also work via the provided roof mounted SOS button in the car. These features are all in addition to the normal safety kit you'd expect these days on any large family car. So every version of this Skoda has twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag, as well as the usual traction and stability control systems, uh, along with ABS brakes, which feature a brake assist system, uh, which helps in emergency stops. And they'll be advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard flashes. Uh, there is also a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill hold control too, to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, and a pair of ice fix child seat fastenings for the middle bench, although annoyingly for parents, not for the third row. If you want to go further, then various safety options beckon. Unlike quite a few rivals in this segment, Skoda makes you pay extra for traffic sign recognition and a driver alert with fatigue sensor system, which monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness. Uh, rear side airbags are optional too, and they come packaged up with Skoda's crew protection assist system. Now that will sense an impending impact before in a fraction of a second, uh, preparing you to better withstand it by closing the sunroof and any open windows while also tensioning the seat belts. And finally, if you want your Kodiak to have a degree of autonomous drive capability and you've avoided base trim and the manual gearbox, you'll want to consider the optional travel assist system. Uh, now for this functionality, it packages in two features that we previously referenced as options, traffic sign recognition and adaptive cruise control. Now with this, a multifunction camera working with the lane assist system provides a predictive element to the way that this car approaches approaches highway and urban travel and the travel assist setup includes a traffic jam assist feature and that will allow this Skoda to drive itself in low speed traffic queues at up to uh, 40 miles an hour. That uses the lane assist technology to keep in lane. If you have to regularly commute in stop and go traffic it's a feature that you'll really come to depend on. We've commented elsewhere in this film that the features updated on this car are pretty much the ones you'd expect to see improved as part of a mid-term model facelift. Uh, what we'd expected here that we didn't see though is a switch to electrified engine technology. 
The mild hybrid and the plug-in hybrid powertrains that Skoda offers on its Octavia family hatch are conspicuous by their absence here. Uh, the latter particularly so, as at the time of this test, Seat was offering continental markets a PHEV version of its identically engineered rival Turaco model. Without these additions, the engine lineup here seems pretty similar to the original model, uh, which actually isn't quite true because the units on offer are actually from the VW Group's uh, much newer Evo generation. Now, the main changes concern the pair of 2-litre TDI diesels, which are of the conglomerate's latest cleaner twin dosing kind and as a result emit up to 80% less NOx nitrogen oxides. As a result, uh, the 150 PS variant most will want manages up to 141 grams per kilometer of CO2 in front driven form and up to 52.3 mpg on the combined cycle. Now that isn't bad at all for a big family seven seat SUV. Uh, to give you a bit of class perspective, a rival front driven Land Rover Discovery Sport D165 can only manage 168 grams per kilometer and 44 miles per gallon. Having said that though, the base front driven Kodiak diesel's efficiency showing, uh, it still leaves you rated up at 33% for benefiting kind taxation, which is where provision of a PHEV version would have been useful of course. Plus, this showing is a fair chunk behind what exactly the same engine and DSG auto gearbox combo achieves in an equivalent Octavia hatch, 119 grams per kilometer and 61.4 mpg. Such is the penalty for choosing an SUV. With four-wheel drive on a 2-litre TDI 150 PS Kodiak, the figures are best of 155 grams per kilometre and 47.9 mpg. And with the top 2-litre TSI 200 PS 4x4 model, you're looking at bests of 42.2 mpg and 175 grams per kilometre. All very class competitive thanks to the 2 litre TDI engine's advanced SCR exhaust gas treatment system which uh, specifically injects the usual AdBlue diesel additive in front of the setup's two catalytic converters to create the efficient twin dosing arrangement that we mentioned earlier on. For most Kodiak customers, uh, the main alternative to diesel power in this car will be the 1.5 litre TSI petrol unit, uh, the only one that can be ordered with manual transmission. As before, this power plant features cylinder deactivation, which can cut out two of the engine's four cylinders at low to medium throttle speeds. As a result, it's pretty clean and frugal. It manages bests of 155 grams per kilometer and 47.9 mpg in manual form, or 158 grams per kilometer and 40.4 as a DSG auto. Skoda also still offers the 190 PS version of its 2 litre TSI petrol unit for the few that will want that. Uh, with that one, you're looking at bests of 168 grams per kilometer and 34.5 miles per gallon. Here, as we've mentioned throughout this film, we've been trying the top VRS model, which has swapped out the 2-litre by TDI diesel that it used to have for a 245 PS version of the 2-litre TSI engine as part of this update. You might think that would make this top sporting variant a lot thirstier, but actually it's quoted 32.5 mpg combined cycle fuel showing. It's quite close to the old diesel model's 35.3 figure. Partly this has uh, been made possible because Skoda has introduced a range of efficiency measures for both versions of that 2 litre TSI power plant, headlined by the increase of injection pressure up to 350 bar. That also helps CO2 emissions and they're rated at up to 198 grams per kilometre. Will all those quoted figures be really achievable in real world motoring? Well, in the wake of the Volkswagen Group's dieselgate fiasco, that's a fair enough question to ask. Uh, the answer depends on how many of the driver oriented efficiency tools you're prepared to use on a regular basis. In cars fitted with drive mode selection driving modes, there's an eco setting and that softens off the throttle response and on the DSG automatic models, it gets the gearbox to change up earlier to optimize economy. 
This setting also saves fuel by only sending energy to the air conditioning and to the power steering when it's actually needed. Uh, you can monitor air conditioning system energy usage via a selectable convenience consumers readout on the central dash infotainment monitor. What else? Uh, well, the relatively low curb weight certainly helps. After all, an entry-level diesel Kodiak tips the scales at only 1,778 kilos in seven-seat form. Compare that to the unladen weight of a comparable base diesel Land Rover Discovery Sport D165, 1,925 kilos. And we should point out that a fully equipped 4x4 diesel version of the Skoda does edge up towards the two-ton mark, but overall this remains easily the lightest car in its segment. Not great for durability in the Serengeti, but ideal for suburbia. Whatever power plant you choose, as you'd expect in this day and age, all models get a start-stop system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, uh, when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. And the DSG automatic transmission is equipped with a coasting function, uh, which at cruising speeds will disconnect the gearbox, leaving the engine to idle until you next need it. Earlier we mentioned the urea-based AdBlue solution that is used by the diesel variants that's stored in a 12-litre tank mounted in the rear beneath the boot. Uh, this will need topping up as part of regular servicing and you can monitor its status via the dashboard display. Uh, talking of servicing, the recommended intervals for all engines are based around a 20,000 mile two-year regime and you can budget ahead for maintenance costs by taking out a fixed price servicing plan at point of purchase and that will cover you for the first two scheduled garage visits. Another financial burden that you'll want to plan around is insurance, although the Kodiak helps here by sitting in lower groups than most of its direct rivals. The cheapest variant to get cover for is the 150 PS 1.5 litre TSI petrol model which comes with the Group 18E ranking. Uh, the 190 PS 2 litre TSI petrol variants come in at Group 27E. Uh, this top 2 litre TSI 245 PS VRS model is rated at Group 30E. As for the TDI diesel Kodiaks that most buyers will want, the 2 litre TDI 150 PS models are rated between Group 20E and 22E, depending on the variant you choose. Uh, the top 2 litre TDI 200 PS 4x4 derivative, that comes in at Group 27E. Finally, we should mention residual values, which is an area where Skoda usually performs surprisingly well. Uh, the Kodiak is not going to upset that form, with industry experts predicting residual values in the 42% range after the usual three-year ownership period. The base diesel 4x4 variants do best on residuals. And finally, while it's certainly true that other rivals better the three-year 60,000-mile warranty that Skoda provides, you can extend your cover to four or five years by paying extra. Not that you really need to, actually. Uh, the brand regularly tops independent consumer satisfaction surveys, so according to real people, there are a few more satisfying cars to own. Today, over 40% of all the cars Skoda sells are SUVs. A modern era reinvention of the brand started with this Kodiak. This revised version of the original model didn't need too many changes, and it hasn't had them. If you didn't already want a Kodiak before, you probably still won't want one now. But if this Czech family crossover does take your interest, then there are now even more reasons to feel satisfied with your choice. We are surprised that Skoda hasn't taken the opportunity here to add the electrified tech that it does have access to through the VW Group. Mild hybrid or plug-in hybrid engines would put this car far more on trend, but they would also delete this model's primary selling point, strong value. And in compensation, some useful steps forward have been made with the conventional combustion power plants, although we are disappointed that these no longer include the charismatic by TDI diesel that used to power the top VRS. Today's petrol-powered Kodiak VRS is a rather different thing, and it's a bit more difficult to justify than its predecessor. 
but the mainstream models that we'd prefer to recommend have usefully more showroom want one factor than before, particularly inside where the improved screen tech and little touches like enhanced ambient lighting make the cabin feel significantly more upmarket than was the case before. As with the original model, we also like the little touches Take the umbrellas in the doors that'll be so welcome when you've set out ill-equipped for a rainy day. Or the way the audio system amplifies your voice so you don't have to bellow at kids in the very back. And in summary, well, yes, the Kodiak isn't particularly engaging to drive, but what car in this sector is? And anyway, its other attributes are far more important for customers in this segment. Comfort, refinement, uh, decent all-round value and spacious seven-seat practicality, all of which means one thing. If you have a growing family, a sensible budget and a desire for the style of an SUV, the Kodiak is still a car that you can't ignore.